No, I'm talking about science fiction. <laughs> you don't know anywhere near as much science fiction as I do. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Give me your agonizer. Give me your agonizer. I don't have an agonizer. It's right over there. <laughs> you, you're my agonizer. <laughs> Hi, this is Steve. This is Bob. This is Jay. And this is Alpha Quadrant 6. We are a science fiction review show. And today we are reviewing Blade Runner because it's November 2019, which is the exact time that the movie took place. Wow. 35 years later? 35, 1982. 82, yeah. so it's 37 years. 37, 37 years, years after years the original later. movie. Oh, so that's the thing that I would... <laughs> We're not wow. living in the future, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> We're living right and it's now. it's cool, but where's the flying cars and, and the replicants? <laughs> I wish I could remember what I thought about the movie when I first saw it. Because first, it would be cool to be like, yeah, okay, flying cars. And, and, and you know, when it's 2019, sure, we'll have flying cars. You know, there, there was a lot of things. Well, I think I, there was a little bit of that. But I think like flying cars are something that always exists in the future. Right? Yeah. That's a scientific trope. The future has the future, whenever that is relative to where you are, that has flying cars. Yeah. And they will forever be in the future because they're never going to be in reality. Well, That's right. wait not a second. Like, not like it was shown not, in the... Not uh, like maybe that. Not, but drone cars? I mean, yeah. they, they, yeah, I sure. think they're looking pretty good at this point. Yeah, but not like the hover cars like in the movie. Not, not any extrapolation yeah. from where we are right now. So not in another 37 no. years. We're not going to be seeing cars like that. Or 137 years, in my opinion. So first we're going to do a general review, yeah. and then we're going to discuss the technology. We're going to talk yeah. about like you know what we are, what was our impression of the technology then? What do we think about yeah. the things they came up with? What they get right? What they get wrong? So I'll start. In general, this movie, I absolutely loved it mm -hmm. when it came out. I oh, watch yeah. it every few years. I, mm -hmm. I've seen both the director's cut and the theatrical release. I, I like both versions. I think the director's cut, you know, has a little bit more meat on the bone for me. Um, you like it with the voiceover or no voiceover? I mean, the voiceover is there, I think, to make it have a little bit more intimacy because you feel a little bit more connected to Decker. Well, um, it was it was there because they changed the they changed the ending, yeah. and the test audiences didn't like it, so they so they 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 changed the ending, and you could and somebody described it as uh, Harrison Ford through gritted teeth doing the voiceover because uh, they 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 recorded that. You know, after it was filmed, yeah. So, so a lot of people hate the voiceover. I don't mind it that much, but a lot of people yeah. hate it. I mean, it's big time. film noir, right? It kind of goes along yeah, with the absolutely. genre, but it is a yeah. cheap sort of device. Sure. Um, you know, to to communicate information to the audience yeah. by having somebody tell it to yeah, you. Don't tell it. Show it. It yeah, didn't tell bother it, me when I heard it. I wasn't cringing at all. Like I, I it, it was. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the voiceover. Yeah. It wasn't. It, it didn't yeah. feel out of place. They, they, they if put, it's done well, it gives a certain emotion. Yeah. About yeah. It. Well, that's the point. You, inside you, that person's head. You have much more of an attachment to the character. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of times, especially in this movie, this movie is really about humanity. Mm -hmm. like what, defining what life is, what is humanity. And being able to attach ourselves to the main character, I think, is very important. You, know, you, want to, you do want some intimacy. You want to care about the character. And you do, of course, in, in both versions of the movie. Yeah, but the idea is you don't need a voiceover to accomplish that. And Harrison Ford doesn't, cer certainly doesn't need a voiceover <laughs> to communicate right. you know, what's going on inside his head to the audience. But well, let's set the stage over. 1982, this is, the, this is based on Philip K. Dick's short story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Mm -hmm. And he wrote that in 68. The movie came out in 82. That, 82... I bet you remember, Steve. That was a hell of a year for movies. We're talking, got my list over here, The Thing, Conan the Barbarian, Wrath of Khan, Poltergeist, um, and the big champ of the year. What was the big champ of the year? In 82? E.T. E.T. Oh, wow. It was a cultural juggernaut. Yeah. That thing was amazing. And, and then here was uh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner came out. I remember going. I, I yeah, loved it. I loved it. It did shit. It didn't make yeah. back its 28 <laughs> yeah. million. The reviews were mixed. It didn't make back the, 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 million. the audiences were like kind of lukewarm on I remember it. We were like, we loved it. We didn't oh, understand why Because we were cool, man. Yeah. We were cool. So, but, but it, took, it took a bunch of years. But as the years mounted, it, it became a cult classic. Yeah. People really recognized this for what it was. The impact that this movie has had on, on culture, on architecture, on fashion, so many things. It's, it's truly mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. um, and well, what That they, was the most impactful thing about the movie. I mean, the storyline was great, but it wasn't that mind blowing, but just the world that Ridley Scott developed. You know, it was dark, it was gritty, 
it was you know it was alien you know to, well, to also right. don't take don't take any credit away from Philip K Dick because oh, yeah. he was writing about the early he was one of the of a handful of writers that were doing cyberpunk that were fleshing yes. out this idea of cyberpunk and I, I don't think the term had been coined even at this point but Blade Runner was the yes. first movie that showed you what cyberpunk really looked like and if you look at it today you're like there's, you know, there's more things that are more cyberpunk than that, but it definitely has the skeleton of a cyberpunk mm -hmm. reality. Oh, sure. And you know, it, the the oppressiveness of the the huge conglomerate mm -hmm. corporations, right? So you have like multi multi trillion dollar corporations that are in charge of everything. The people are running around like insects. You know, they're at the lowest level. Like, it, you know, the rain in the movie is is perfect for for it to be this. It's a ruined world. Yeah, it's a ruined world. Yeah. Um, uh, the nature of this particular version of, of our reality is that everybody that has money or any value right. has left their off world. On the colony. So yeah. if you're left on Earth at this point, there's something wrong. Like you're just a down and out person. You know, you're not. You're not. Generally, yeah, generally. Yeah. I mean, though, the real stroke of genius though was he, he layered the movie with '40s film noir. I mean, that was. I mean. He, all the tropes in From Noir, he, they, he laid on top mm -hmm. of that. The flawed anti-hero, you have the, the femme fatale, you have the corrupt society, um, all mm -hmm. of those. And, and he made it even seem like, some reviews are saying that he made it seem like a black and white movie. And it was not a black and white movie. Yeah. He really, that was a real stroke of genius, I think. That, that really is a thing, I think, that really sh stays with you. That just, that, the cinematography and the look, yeah. uh, more than anything it's else. It's a gorgeous movie. Oh Ridley my God. Scott can shoot the most beautiful Environments. He he's so good at it. I mean, even the script is crap. Yeah, I mean, even in Prometheus, of course, you know that's that's the thing that comes up. The movie was yeah. gorgeous. I mean, he's so good at that. Yeah. Um, I I have to say, like, you got to give him credit, right? Ridley Scott is a genius director. He's made some really like Prometheus is just inexplicably bad. The the writing, mm -hmm. even though the cinematography and the 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 editing and everything else about it was fantastic, yeah. but man, he he's he helmed Aliens. He helmed Blade Runner. You know, like these movies are iconic, incredibly impactful. Alien, movies. the first one. Yeah, Alien. I'm sorry, yeah. the movie Alien. Yeah, Cameron did Aliens, right? Yep. So if you haven't seen it in a while, I would go back and rewatch it. It, it definitely holds up. And Rutger Howard was awesome. I well, mean, that was he was he, just you know, uh, added another you know layer to that movie. That was fantastic. Well, let's talk about a little bit. Let's dig into the idea of the replicants. Mm -hmm. um, you know the replicants are. Are we shifting to the technology? No, no, no. I'm just talking about the movie, like. Yeah. The, you know, but it is a good bridge because that is like the main piece of technology in the movie is yeah. the replicants. We'll get to it. I want to just talk yeah. about why the movie, why the movie is good and why it's still good. Um, you know, the replicants are are representative of humanity, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to see humanity through them and through what they do in a, in a weird kind of way, because because if you compare, as an example, if you compare compare Rudger Hauer's uh, character Roy Batty, to Tyrell, the guy who started Tyrell Corporation, you know, there's obviously like God versus quote unquote man. Mm -hmm. That's what the that's right. what the relationship is, and he's even it even comes up. And even like, father son. Yeah, absolutely. Like prodigal very, son returns, right? Yeah. And you have this, you know, knee jerk reaction that the replicants are evil mm -hmm. because they're being chased and hunted, and they're they're outlaws, and they're they, you know something is wrong. But what happens is. The humans in the movie become less human as the movie goes on, and the replicants who are not human become more, more human. And yeah. in fact, the most human character in the movie is a replicant. Who mm. is it? Right, Roy Batty. No, no. Well, well, you can argue that. You can argue that. But there is someone. There is another replicant that does that is more acts more human throughout the movie. Well, Sean Young, Rachel, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel. She's Rachel. A, well, she's a Nexus Seven, right? She. She doesn't even know she's a replicant. That's right. Well, she is the next generation. That's true. But you know, they were they void void comped her. Mm -hmm. It took more testing for them to figure 100, out like a hundred questions, I think, or something right. like that. And she was having anxiety, t you know, towards this slowly budding realization that she might not be human. But she does. She saves uh, Deckard's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She kills. Uh, you know, she shoots his mm -hmm. gun and kills one of the replicants. Yeah. Um, she fall clearly falls in love with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, she. She's the only human, human or creature in the movie that expresses love in the movie. What do you think about the theory that Deckard is a replicant? Well, it, it depends on which version without, of the movie. Without going to the 2049 version. Oh, no, forget the 2049 version. Yeah. We're just talking about the first one. I mean, in the theatrical release, you, you don't really know that he's right. a replicant. In yeah. the director's cut... It was you, deliberately ambiguous. Yeah. Right, and Harrison Ford will say that he is not a replicant. He, he is adamantly says that, yeah. he, that his character was not a replicant. Uh, Ridley Scott, though, uh, 
Harrison Ford said that, that Ridley Scott kind of agreed with him at some times. He agreed that, okay, he wasn't. But then in other interviews, he says he was. But also, I think the main thing with Scott is that he wanted to be ambiguous. Yes. Yeah, and we don't have to even talk about whether he is or he isn't. I think even in the director's cut, it's a little less ambiguous, but you still never know. The, the steel door mm -hmm. never comes down on it. I mean, you have in the director's cut, um, there's this idea of the unicorn, which was introduced mm -hmm. in the yes. director's cut. And, the, you know, the unicorn is... A replicant, mm -hmm. right? And it and well, I think most the, the, the well, way to put it accurately is Deckard is the unicorn. He's the actual unicorn, and the and he makes an origami unicorn in out of the matchsticks. I think it was, yeah, the, the, the uh, aluminum foil. And then oh, you're right. He, um, but I think the implication there was that how could he possibly have known? That Deckard was daydreaming about a, a unicorn, unless it was an implanted memory. Right. And then the other question is, did yeah. he? Did his partner know he was a replicant? Mm -hmm. You know, because there is a subtle clues in the way he treats Deckard, and he, like when, after he kills Roy Batty, or he doesn't kill him after Roy Batty dies, he said, "You did a good man's work here today." You've done a man's job, sir. Like, it was just something odd about the way you yeah, said that. Yeah, you did a man's work today. Like, you're not really a man, but you did a man's work. Um, wow, yeah, but anyway, like, it's subtle and it's ambiguous, and you're meant to leave like with these very questions that we have without right. there being, as you say, there's no definitive answer. And so there's another angle, though, to, to the movie. Uh, as you know, as forward-looking as it was, it was also very backward-looking in, in some things, like, say, the gender politics. I mean, look at the women in this movie. Mm -hmm. They are... They are they are just playthings. And one Pris was a pleasure model, mm -hmm. replicant pleasure, pleasure model, basic, basic, pleasure basic pleasure not, model. Yeah, not even the souped-up version. And uh, and uh, and Zora was like an exotic dancer. I mean, yeah. and then then there's Rachel, who's kind of like this this kind of like yeah. femme fatale, cold fish, and and she she kind of succumbs to. Uh, to Harrison Ford's advances, you know, kind of abruptly and quickly, and kind of like he's like in control. Mm -hmm. So that, in but, that, but so in that, that sense, was that a deliberate callback to the 1940s genre? Because that would fit. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, I, no, it does. It but, totally fits into that. Yeah, genre. but yeah. It's, it's also true. I agree that whenever you, been, look, whenever you look at any movies that project into the future. They, they take their own they, sensibilities they always with them. Project yes. their current and culture into the future. That's what I think was and happening there. It's always there. shocking when when you look mm -hmm. back. Right. It's like, wow, you know that was so 1960s or whatever it was, you know. Yeah. Um, that is one thing that's the hard, it's harder than extrapolating technology into the future, extrapolating right. culture into the future. Because it's so enmeshed in your reality yeah. that you don't even yeah. think about it as something that might not transfer. I want to get back to Roy Batty because okay. I, you know, there, there's, he, well, he and Pris ha have a relationship too, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you're like, oh, these are replicants. And we're, you know, we're, as we learn about the world, we learn that the replicants don't really have empathy, mm -hmm. and they're not supposed to really have emotion. Like they they were created to be bioengineered slaves. They're they're they're, they're androids. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're genetically created androids. Humans, what are yeah. they? You it's know, ambiguous. I mean, you know, when they, when they were looking at the uh, the eyes that 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 scientist was making in that cold suit, yeah, that scene. I love mm -hmm. that scene. Um, the you know there was like numbers written on the eyes. You know, like there was mm -hmm. you know there were like components. You know, yeah. like component parts to a computer. Um, but they develop human uh, emotions, and that's mm -hmm. why they went rogue, and they wanted right. more life. And then you realize at the end of the movie, like Roy Batty, he killed Tyrell because Tyrell created him flawed. You know, like, like you know, he, he his life was being a slave. And then he, he's reminiscing when he's dying. He's reminiscing about the wonderful things that he got to see in the, the four brief years that he got to live. He's literally sticking nails into himself to keep him. You know, keep his adrenaline hemmed mm -hmm. up. I guess so. Yeah, he, yeah he had, to, you know, he was to stay off his death. You know, even yeah. even a minute or two. And then he has this incredible death scene where he the tears in the rain speech. Yeah, first he rescues Deckard because he at that moment he becomes a human being, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like he he leveled. He became you know he he experienced <laughs> enough emotion. He saves him and he tells him about his life and his experiences. And then he and then Rutger Hauer came up with the the uh, the tear. You know. All those moments are lost in the rain, like lost like tears in the right. rain. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> kind of not not nearly as good. It was too long, mm -hmm. so he basically shortened it and he added that best line at the end. Yeah. All those moments being being lost. He so he he made. I mean, he pushed that mm -hmm. character. Roy Batty is Roy Batty because of Howard. Worker himself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, he he really had input, and he made him who he was. There was one director who described him in the. He gave him the best 
succinct explanation. He described Roy Batty as a romantic, flamboyant, sexualized dandy, half rock star, half terrorist. Yeah. How perfect is that? I mean, <laughs> yeah. that is Roy Batty, right? Isn't that perfect? Yeah. And that, and that, that character is like that because of Rutger, not because yeah. of anybody else, really. He, he's the main person that made that, made that happen. Yeah, give, give him props. He, he's one, oh my of my, God. one of my favorite actors of the time. He always had such, a, such gravitas. Mm -hmm. where, you know, I could you know, mention other roles that he was in, but I just love him in that role. He looks so cool, too. I mean, he totally has that cyberpunk mm -hmm. look and his yeah. coat and everything. Yeah. It, was just, it was just perfect. And that description I gave was from Stephen Dalton, an, a writer who wrote about uh, this movie. All right. Um, Song okay. by the Tech. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we'll talk. We'll start with the replicants. And something that's always bothered me about this movie is that it's really hard to understand exactly what the replicants are mm -hmm. because they're clearly biological, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, they I mean, are entirely. They are entirely, entirely biological, biological because they but are. But they're not. They're not just genetically manipulated humans. They're engineered humans. Yeah, like right. if you're making the components, like I made your eyes. Yeah, you know, and I was responsible that's, for this. Like that's what's that's the confusing part because you had that uh, Hannibal was it Hannibal Chu. Made his made his yeah. eyes. R. F. Sebastian made his hands. What exactly does that mean? Because they make on the other end, the other side of the coin, they make a very strong argument that these replicants are indistinguishable yeah. from humans. You can only determine that they are human, that they are not human, by doing the void comp test because because their their emotions are, are completely compromised. Right. That that's like the main way. By that, that's really the main way. But they're also they've got some kind of not. I wouldn't say super. I've thought about this. They have it's not really superhuman strength. I don't think it's more it's it's more of like like the best a human can be, the strongest a human can be. Because, oh. And if you think about it, when they reach in the liquid nitrogen, but the feats that, the feats that they pulled off, I used to think that, that he's superhuman, but not necessarily. But, but these are engineers, these are bioengineered people. They, what makes them extraordinary though is that you have to assume that these are, these are probably grown, right? They're not, mm -hmm. they're not like, I don't think they're 3D printed. They even had that concept back then. They were probably grown. And the, the fact that you could grow a body, I would think in a relatively short period of time, that's, that's truly but remarkable. But they're not just grown. Because they are manufactured, they're bioengineered. Because they make they make a point like the yeah. eyes are numbered, and mm -hmm. they, this, but the so snake what? scales have signatures on the scales. You know. Yeah, but I I, I think you could bioengineer an eye and still grow it. You, do you think they actually you, tinkered that eye together? Well, it no, 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 no. Like they might it. have grown the eye. Right, yeah. but it was really somebody just coming up with but a did, genetic sequence they didn't to create grow the, the eye. The whole person, though. That's what I'm saying. Right, but yeah, the p components could have been grown yeah. kind of se kind of separately so, put yeah, together. It, it's not just that though. They, that that part of their you know, psychology and part of their memories were coming from the scientists who made them. So, right, well, right. yeah, because uh, the main guy, uh, Tyrell, he's, he made the brain, right? He made, what does that mean when you make the brain? What does that mean? They don't go into detail. Yeah. It's really they're, frustrating. They're often described as artificial intelligence, but is it really biological right. intelligence? What is, it's right. not like, there's not a... They're biological, they bleed. They are, they, they they are breathe, biological. They, have, they, eat. they are yeah. absolutely biological. They had a scene that was cut from the movie where they were describing the, the autopsy. They said, and they, uh, Deckard's boss was saying that they did an autopsy for two to three hours and before they found out. I mean, that's a, that's a human. Yeah. That's yeah. essentially yeah. a human. Yeah. So here's a description from the, um, from the screenplay uh, written in February to May, 81. They, they, they wanted to go with, like, what is, a, like, what is an android? And they were describing the various definitions. Uh, so the third definition was third generation synthogenetic mm -hmm. replicant, constructed of skin flesh culture, selected enogenic transfer conversion, capable of self-perpetuating thought, paraphysical abilities, developed for emigration program. So mm -hmm. to, the, the key word there is synthogenetic, yeah. right? Synth, you know, synthetic genetics. Um, eno... Enogenic transfer, that's, that's, that's techno babble. Yeah. It means nothing. Mm -hmm. It means to swim out, to escape by swimming. That doesn't really mean anything. So, yeah, these are absolutely people. They are like optimized people that have yeah, been yeah. engineered, uh, which, is, which is kind of, you don't see that a lot in science fiction. Usually it's, it's a robot with mechanical parts or an android that looks the very, very human, but not quite. They're Fallout 4 synths. That's mm -hmm. what they are. They're synths from Fallout 4. They're so. like, you know, the, the movie Westworld from the 70s. Yeah, Westworld. Yeah. They were really right. robotic. And the right new on. HBO version. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that they had, they had such control over the, over the genetics that they could do this, and the fact that they could grow the body, those are all extraordinary technical achievements. But I would argue that, I mean, if you have that much level of control at the, at the genetic level, I mean, they could have, they could have they could have tweaked these guys into real super super people. Well, you don't know. We don't know how long that they've existed in the, right. in the movie. And yeah, it's only twenty. You know, yeah. twenty nineteen doesn't seem. Tyrell seemed right now. To, to be sitting on the most. You know, he seemed to be the most powerful human alive, mm -hmm. right? Because he's you know he's probably supplying, oh, supplying these slave mm -hmm. laborers. 
throughout the whole known, you know, every, everywhere that people are. He made this emigration yeah. into space possible, right, with, the, mm -hmm. with, with his uh, replicants, right. I think. So I, you can, I, you know, I've always just assumed, it was always in the back of my head that, like, he's an anomaly. This company it came out with tech. You know, the rest of the world isn't teched up like the synths are. You know what I mean? The synth technology doesn't really fit in this world. It, it fits in a world that's hundreds or even a thousand years in the future of this world. Because like, what else do we got? Like, you know, quickly compare it to some of the other technology. That technology is so nuanced and, and futuristic to everything else. I just always thought Tyrell was kind of like, you know, an Elon Musk, like, you know, or, you know, well, so yeah, I mean, I thought he was like a little ahead of his time in the movie, but not, you know, hundreds of years. It wasn't out of place for the movie, it seemed for the vibe of the it movie. Didn't From 82, it seemed totally reasonable, right? It didn't right? seem out of place, but when you really think about what they achieved, you know, they're, mm. they're growing people. That's so much more advanced than a flying car. You know what Is I mean? It? Yeah. I think we'll get I think we'll grow artificial people before we have a flying car. You really think so? <laughs> yeah, I do. You really, you really, With CRISPR? oh my God. Sure. All right. I mean, I, I'm in. I'm in. I'm just saying, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, we, you know, you're not breaking any laws of physics. So, if we compare the Blade Runner tech to modern, like 2019 in the real world, starting with the replicants, obviously we're nowhere near that. Right. right? So, that is like way, that's 100 years or more in, in the future, I think, of where we are. So, I just said we, that. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, Let's but let's click over to the uh, the flying car. Okay. Yeah. So that's a science fiction trope, as we mentioned yeah. previously. Yeah. It's like in they're the future, gorgeous, man. Yeah, they, and they're hover cars. You know, like there's no helicopter blades, there's no exhaust. They're just anti gravity, like hover yeah. type cars. Pretty much. Pretty but we're much. closer pretty much. to them now than we've ever been. I mean, we have, well, not that kind of flying car. No, to having we, like a drone. Yeah, but we have they're, drones that can yeah. simulate something like that. I mean, maybe not at that weight, and, and uh, you know, we're not fully there. You could functionally have something similar with a drone like technology. Yeah, yeah. maybe in like twenty years. And we probably and we probably like will. That. I mean, they've yeah. made some huge. I mean, drone technology is yeah. going crazy. Yeah. Uh, so I think we definitely will. I've seen preliminary designs that seem completely reasonable. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that type of technology, though, that's kind of like, um, uh, I mean, you see, you see it a lot. It's, it's almost, almost magical. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is two, three tons that's just, you know, just floating just with floating. no apparent noise. No, you know, there's yeah. no sound. Yeah. There's no it was evidence. Anti -grav for all it was anti -grav, right, basically. Yeah. And I, luckily, I, I went to Disney World and I did see that car. The mm. original prop of the car. Oh. Yeah, it was outside. They just have it in the regular weather. Right. You figure they'd have right. it in a museum or something. Wow. Um, all right, now uh, the next thing is the video phone. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's an obvious future technology that, that people, nobody back then realized that no one's going to give a crap about mm -hmm. video phones. Nobody cares about them. And they're, and so I can't blame them for going there, but it would have been really. It's like, yeah, in the 80s. All future had video phones. Right. right. Yeah, aliens had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. without a doubt. Um, Better than that, though, are the the the, the multi-story, uh, you know, moving video on buildings. Oh, that was huge. Uh, I mean, yeah, but let's, let's go to off, Times let's, Square. Let's get off the video phone though first. So, okay, still more because we have phone. to talk about um, the fact that there are no cell phones, no mm -hmm. smartphones. Right. He goes into a phone booth yeah. to make that video wow. phone call. Yeah. They, they completely, they, they basically missed the internet and smartphones. We can't blame them. I, mean, we, you know. I know, but that's a big... No, yes, we can. They're stupid. Miss. They it should have seen cool. it. It seemed cool when the movie came out. It seemed like, yeah, that's futuristic. It seemed like... It, 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 know, it none of us were saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about the smartphones and internet? Yeah, why, why we they, weren't saying why that. Why aren't they carrying around their phone? Well, I don't know. If you think about it, though, yeah, the, carrying around mobile communication, this seems pretty obvious yeah. if you're really thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, where they're communicating. Right, oh right. Do. Hindsight being 20 No, but they're not Star Trek communicators, man. I mean, that's... Well, right. they it, was, there. it was a clear choice that they made, and we noticed. I think we, I remember noticing. You know, that okay, they, really, they went to a phone booth. You know, in thirty. I don't remember that. I okay, do, I do. Um, that was very film noir, though, as well. I you agree. Know, they all could be designed. So, I, I don't think that Ridley Scott's choices were all him trying to realistically portray two thousand. No, me neither. Me neither. I, I, they were artistic choices mm -hmm. for the movie, right? But it's still informed by our vision of like what's realistic. Because I, I don't think he wanted the audience to be watching that and go, "This is in two thousand and nineteen. Like this is unrealistic for then." I think he wanted people just to, to buy into it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay, this is a vision of the future yes. that is semi-plausible. Just accept the premise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. nothing that he did broke that premise right. you know, at the time. But and but you, now you said there was no internet, but they did have like uh, police databases in the car. Like, yeah. So that was that was pretty. They had cool. databases, but clearly it wasn't a digital world like we know mm. our own digital world. Right. 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 It, it wasn't that there wasn't the social media. There wasn't you know the casual access right. to, to yeah. the internet. Yeah. You can't really fault them. The smartphones. Oh, dramatic I mean, disconnect. From it's the like way 10 years before World Wide Web uh, really appeared. It so. seems out of place when you look at it today because 
you know, it, it is a major thing that we right. have fully realized. You know, we have mm -hmm. this amazing network that is just not in the film. But I, I, I'm, you know, it doesn't bother me. But the digital billboards were a prominent feature yep. in the movie and gave it really contributed yeah. to its look. Yep. And we have those now. We've been to Times Square. Oh Man, I thought they were so cool. I love, I love how in the film, like the, 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 the digital billboards have like a, you know, like every other line is missing look. Mm -hmm. Like a real digital, mm -hmm. you know, almost like an analog digital look, as, as weird as yeah, that sounds. because the world is, it, by our, again, our eyes, uh, post-digital revolution, it's a very analog looking world. Yeah. Um, which includes the physical photographs, yeah. right? Like yeah. really a drawer full of physical photographs. I mean, it's, who has that anymore? Um, or, that, or the software, the voice-activated software to manipulate those images, yeah. right? That so was, voice yeah. activated, sure. We Absolutely. I don't know, Steve. The, uh, I mean, we do use video phone today. It no, is, I know. They're, it's they're, cooked into our devices. Yeah. It, it is a part of like, our lives today. Skype and FaceTime and whatever. I, I get what you're saying, though. Like back in the 80s, People really were like, "That's going to be something we're going to." That's use the next the step. As yeah. soon as we can, we will have it. that. Will be you will never phone call somebody. You will video call them, uh, and now people do a whole bunch of different things. They text, yeah. sometimes preferentially they email, they they audio call, or they they FaceTime, they phone call. Yeah. So it's all depending on the context. Et and some people have different preferences, but it isn't something that the video phone call didn't take the over default. the world. Yeah, yeah it didn't, the didn't take it over. Yeah, but they don't have they don't have voice activated, you know, like Photoshop, where you can manipulate mm -hmm. and look at the pictures with right. just with your voice. But uh, you know, voice interaction with the computer is is pretty big, and it's going to get even bigger. So and so they kind of hit on that one. Yes, yeah, so I think so you, what give, was you, give, you give them a win for voice activated. Sure, yeah, that we have that now. That's that was pretty much right. on yep. the spot. The um, but relying on analog photographs, that was kind of dated. Yeah. But then the manipulating the photograph, enhancing and zooming, okay. But the degree to which, I mean, we thought this was such a cool part of the movie. It was a yeah. big part it of the movie. It was an awesomely they, cool part. It was an important plot point as well as just that we were like, but they, they stayed on the it. They took their time. Yeah. You played with that thing. Yeah. And it was, it was, it's still it, entertaining to watch. It, absolutely. But that's the Esper machine. That's the Esper, Esper machine. machine. Completely okay. unrealistic even today. Yes, we have uh, software that can enhance photographs, but they are either um, just filling in the, the missing data probabilistically, mm -hmm. you know, by comparing it to a million other photos online or whatever, um, but, or they're interpolating, but they're not adding data, right? You would, yeah. that, that data that, that Deckard got found yeah. on the photograph wasn't there. Wait, how do you find, know? You know? My, why? Because my... my I remember he was watching, going around corners. Yeah, and the, stuff. I, I remember. No, no. I, this is this is what my memory of that scene when I first saw it and when I've seen it since then. My memory was that that that, that image was so dense, like yeah. a like a fifty megapixel, we have those. hundred megapixel we have image those, yeah. that you can go deep. And when he when he seemed to be turning corners and stuff, he was looking through the reflections. And when you got reflections, you can just keep going so deep. That's how I interpret that. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. I agree, Bob. We have the, you ever do this? I, I've seen many pictures yes. on the internet where you could just keep zooming in and keep zooming in and keep zooming in and you're going way past like, you know, objects. Well, that, that's because they take, a, they literally take like 100,000 pictures and put them all together. Yeah, yeah They've but that's it. a digital photograph. This was an analog little Polaroid. Well, wait, wait, yeah. wait, 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 though. But, but still. But encoded on that paper, right? So this is what the machine had to be doing. Wait, how do you have to assume that? Right, because we're right. not getting metaphysical here. Encoded on that paper. Whatever that substrate was, you know, could have been it could have been a data paper as far as we know. You know, whatever. He puts yes. it in the machine, it scans it, and it showed how dense mm -hmm. the, the information was on there. Now the, the bending around corners and stuff, I'd have to watch it again because I kind of bo remember it both ways. There was okay. definitely a reflection. That was the yeah. key, was you saw the thing in the reflection. Then, yeah, yeah, once you once you're you're in a reflection, then you could really kind of like Go into areas of the picture. But it did that seem normally like he was going see. like this in the picture. Like mm. it seemed like he was kind of you know Kind of breaking that thing that we're saying yeah, about the about going three dimensionally yeah. into it. Yeah. But that that was part of the mystique of it, and even yeah. today, the noises that they used, the the way that he talked, the way that the thing, like uh, you know, the interface worked when it zoomed in and blah blah blah. Five right. Stop. Center and stop. They did all those cool, yeah. like visual audio. Visual I always liked things. it. I couldn't figure out his the, the nomenclature that he was using to actually navigate to twelve twelve point oh, seven. That was all, what, I'm sure that, that was complete BS. That, man? If Go anyone, a little bit to the left. If anyone knows about. better, yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, a normal person would be like zoom in a little bit and, and scroll to the right, right, right. You know, but he's giving coordinates and stuff mm. to make you realize he's used this machine before. Right, mm. it was part of the movie. It's ultra precise. But if anybody right. out there knows, like, if the, if there was a legitimate, you know topography type of you know thing that he was talking about if it was just BS. Yeah, yeah.
Um, <laughs> all right, so let's, let's talk about the next thing. There, there's, there's still a few more cool things in the movie, technologically speaking. Um, now, one where, you know, I know we talked about uh, the replicants, but the animals in the movie, mm -hmm. first they were illegal, and they were, it was a feature in the movie. There was an owl, there was a snake. You know, there was they no. Were all, they were replicants too. Yeah, there were no real animals yeah, in the movie. And right. That, that was an, it was a, a very interesting part of the film because you got the sense that lots of stuff was fake. The owl seemed to lose some agency to me when you found out that it wasn't mm -hmm. real. Right. Okay. You but know? yeah, you remember someone said, "Oh, was that?" It was with Harrison Ford said, "Is that a real owl?" And she's like, "You think I'd be snake? Yeah. Did that a real thing? You think I'd be here if it were real?" Which meant that they, they had like an ecological catastrophe. Yes. yes. And then we learned when twenty forty nine that there was a there was a, a nuclear war in two thousand or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that to me that meant like, boy, the Earth is in really bad shape. Really, yes. bad, shape. really bad shape. Yeah. That you're rich if you own a snake. I mean, you, yeah. you own like a Picasso. It's like what? Well, I think the, the real point there was like, there's not on this planet. You have to be They're, off world, right? And that's the next technology we need to talk. Talk about mm -hmm. the off world, oh. off world. They, they were, had clearly had faster than light travel. I, we, we can only assume, like yeah. you know, unless people are, you know, where, where was the? He was saying he was in Orion's belt, or, off the shoulder of Orion. Yeah, right. like we don't know what that that's, exactly. That's Beetlejuice, means, isn't but it? It seems <laughs> really far away. So if FTL exists, wow. Yeah. Wow, but definitely terraforming. In has time, to exist. I mean, in time to like actually build ships and then build colonies. I mean, that's again that. Even at the time, I'm like, there's no way we're going to have that infrastructure in 30 plus That's years. That's right. I mean, just no way. And we know because Roy Batty said that they live four years, or somebody says, I think, four it, was, years. I think it was the four police years. chief said they have a four year lifespan. So we know that he had to get there and back yeah. within four years. Within four years. You know, which is yeah. not a lot of time, not at all a lot of time for space travel. They should have tacked at least a hundred years onto that. To, to yeah, the but time. if they wanted to be zipping around the, yeah, right. the, yeah. the, you know, the galaxy. Yeah. But they showed so little of it, I didn't, I didn't really mind. But I remember it, it stuck out to me. Like, okay. you saying, off the shoulder run. Are you kidding me? These, in 2019, they, they have FTL drives? Yeah. Warp drive or whatever the hell they're doing? I mean, that, to me, I was like, all right, that's yeah. nonsense. That Somebody was, won a Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> or, or Ted. And the, vo the Voigt, it's not Voigt, it's Voigt Comp. Voigt Comp, comp yeah. Um, that, was a, that was a cool machine. It was, first off, the, visually, it was really cool. Like, it had, like, that respirator thing mm -hmm. going on, which is, it's just weird and, and <laughs> perfect. It was just perfect, you know? Um, and then he's, like, looking at the eye. And the first time we see it, he's interviewing um, one of the replicants. I love that actor. Yeah, he, was, yeah. he was in a lot of movies. He's yeah, always, like, a bad guy because yeah. he has, like, a rough look. And the guy was, like, giving him attitude. And, um, and I just thought it was such a cool thing. And that machine was essentially testing the, the replicant to see if it was human or not. And it was testing its emotion. It's an mm -hmm. emotional, it really is about the emotional response and they're measuring that. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, so they're asking questions about their past and saying, what would you do if a turtle turned over? Would you turn it over? Mm -hmm. Like these are emotional things. You know, but what was interesting was um, it seemed like the replicant knew that he was kind of getting figured out. He was yeah. trying to pretend that he was human. And then that's why he ended up killing him. Because he's like, uh-uh, you're not, you're not going to take yeah, me down. You're not buying it. But they were, he was becoming more human. Mm -hmm. They were in process. You know, if they lived a couple more years, maybe they would be right. fully... Well, I mean, some people say that, that that's one of the main reasons they have a four-year lifespan. It's because after four years, they, they start developing empathy and, and real emotions, and you can't tell who, who they are. You can't which, control them you, also. Right, and which is kind of silly, though, because, I mean, if, if, they, if their eyes and hands are manufactured, if they've got those little codes... I mean, how hard could it be? Really, could it be to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to really detect them? besides doing a void comp, you know, test on them. Um, it, but so that's interesting, though. That that's the four-year lifespan may be directly related to this, the fact that yeah. empathy may have way developed. Well, look at what happened. I mean, in this world, Blade Runners exist. You know, Deckard was a Blade Runner. He was an expert mm -hmm. hunter. You know, he 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 hunted down Retire. replicants. He retired. Replicants. Murdered, really? And yeah, it was it was completely murdered, especially at that point. Like the ones that are running away, they're developing emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, all the other ones that just kind of stay where they are are, are you know somewhat more robotic. Um, and I just find that so interesting that you know they they limit the lifespan because that's pretty much when they know that they're going to start develop. You know, the Tyrell Corporation knows that the, the four year lifespan is put in place for a specific reason. Why would you destroy something that probably costs millions and millions of dollars? You know, they could grow them. Basically. Yeah.
All right, hope you enjoyed our uh, very timely review, November 2019, of Blade Runner, an epic sci-fi classic. If you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it recently, Check I would it recommend watch it. watching it That's again. That's all. Definitely stands, stands the test of time. And Until if you like time. the show, you can go to alphaquadrant6.com. You can become a patron of ours and help us continue doing these shows. So what we did was I recently changed our patron uh, account, our Patreon mm -hmm. account. So now it's a month, monthly charge. It used to be a mm -hmm. episodic charge. So with the monthly charge, um, you get an entry into the Star Trek phaser mm -hmm. contest, mm -hmm. which you can see kind of one over the shoulder of Bob's. Uh, there's partially assembled. Partially assembled. Yeah. Um, and you can go to alphaquadrant6.com forward slash T3 to enter that. You could also uh, listen to our podcast with the episodes growing weekly. And we'll talk to you soon.